Now, this interview has probably been a little bit overdue. We are <laughs> combined. What we're about to do is put four relatively older gentlemen of the fitness industry in one room to have a pod. Well, not in one room, but in multiple rooms, but in one podcast to chew through, well, I don't know, Leon and John from, oh, uh, AKA The Lean Machines, on to just come and wax lyrical about what it's like over spending a decade in the industry and these guys were there at the start of content creation and this is just a great story of of their learnings and lessons along the way yeah i was expecting it to be fairly honest and just like they're straight up guys like that's what that's what you sort of that's what you see and actually having had the conversation now just sort of blown away by just their their honesty and their openness and just free willing to share that because they know that by them being honest and sharing that true reflection of, of themselves, where they're at now, how they've got there, like it just, it's going to, that's going to give everyone listening to regardless of what, what your current situation, whatever it is that you're doing, the, for you to just step into that place of just being like the best version of yourself, which is just you being honest about who you are. And um, yeah, I I couldn't be yeah blown away by that. It's uh, it's a it's a great one. So you can absolutely uh, yeah you can absolutely love it. I think. So we won't delay you any longer from the uh, from the worlds of wisdom from the Lee Machines. Um, if you want to check out our online training platforms or any workshops that we've got coming up, if you want to go and give yourself a little dose of movement, strength, and play, you can find us all on schoolofcalisthenics.com. Just go and check out what we've got going on, and we hopefully will see you either online or in person before long. Roll that jingle listen players <laughs> you're listening to the movement strength and play podcast by the school of calisthenics here are your hosts tim and jacko so welcome to the movement strength and play podcast the lean machines how are you doing john and leon very good. Thank you, chaps. Thanks for having us. Yeah, absolute pleasure to be here. This is my first little bit of work um, speaking in the last couple of weeks. So you will get a nice, probably jet lag voice at some point, but we'll get through it. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll talk about what you've been up to and where you've been. Um, but I was thinking, my, my, the thing I was going on in the intro was thinking of like dynamic duos. And I was like, the dynamic duos, meet another dynamic. I was like, what is a pair of dynamic, what a dynamic, a dynamic duo of dynamic duos? Now I was thinking of Batman and Robin. Now I was thinking, oh. is there another dynamic duo or is it only literally Batman and Robin? I was considering us, the four of us being like a, a pair of dynamic duos. Anyway, that's not really a very good question. Is it Step Brothers, really? <laughs> Step Brothers. Yes. yes. <laughs> Who would you be, Dale? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Curly, well, they're both curly hair. Yeah. So. I'd be Brendan. He's taller. Yeah. He's a nerd as well. <laughs> <laughs> so, fellas, just give us a little bit of a background of like... Um, the, the the short version we want to get into some good conversation of like where did it where did it actually all start for you and i'm imagining like way back was it was it youtube before instagram was even it was facebook before it's like now who cares about fate or what like what what's that journey been like for you and where where did it actually all kick off and, and how do you boys know each other well, it kind of all start. We've, we've been best friends for years and obviously working as personal trainers, our first gym, we both worked at the same gym together and it kind of started um, basically filming videos on a spud, what it looked like, yeah. a little handy cam um, back in the day. We were basically very hungry personal trainers in our local area and what we found was as personal trainers, you were seen as naturally quite unapproachable anyway. We had quite big personalities. We loved working out, high-fiving, having a laugh with people. And there was always this encouragement to go and correct people's form in the gym. And we always understood and remembered it from being young gym users ourselves that you're in an already uncomfortable environment. Can you imagine what kind of emotional turmoil this person's going to go through by me going, even in a nice way, you're doing that wrong, try doing this. It just always didn't feel right. So John came to me one day and was like, tell you what, why don't we film YouTube videos of like tutorials and information for people and just put it somewhere and they can take it or leave it. Um, and back in the day, you know, we're talking 10, 12 years ago, music rights meant that basically videos would just get ripped down as soon as you did anything. So 
we just started at like 10 o'clock at night when the gym closed, film till midnight, film a load of content, and then just started spewing it out three times a week. Um, and, that, and that's how it kind of started. And as they say, you know, the, the, the rest is history, really. Nice. So it started with YouTube. Oh, you... Yeah, YouTube, YouTube was numero uno for us in terms of like s- stepping into the social yeah, media is, sphere. This is before YouTube was a revenue maker before it was really anything and before really you'd even really have YouTube as your go-to place to search for things if I'm being honest this is 10 11 years ago now this is not too far after MySpace and that type of time so we're way before TikTok (laughs) did we even still have Bebo accounts back then Right. Um, Bebo was gone. <laughs> Bebo was gone. It was Bebo, MySpace, and then we start talking uh, at Facebook, which is obviously now Meta. By the way, Leon, have you got a filter on your webcam? I feel like I haven't got a wrinkle on my face. So like I've, I've just, I'm like ten years just, younger. I just, I just naturally put someone on a little oh, bit, like a little it. bit of blush. I just smeared some makeup on the mirror. Yeah. Well, if you want to, if you want to know how how long ago this was for us, I remember sitting there starting a Twitter account with John's older sister, not knowing what Twitter was, but just being told you have to have Twitter. And then when we got to the lean machines on Instagram, we had a fan account had made the lean machines before we even had an Instagram account. So this is like how far back we've (laughs) gone. And literally the expectation for us and the only hope was we might gain some clients because you know, we're in our local area, we're putting content out. We didn't even we didn't even see YouTube as this huge global tool. It was just a cool way to help people in an approachable way that wasn't right in their face and it might turn into a few clients. That was the mm. sheer naivety of the, yeah. the dream. And how ironic it is that now it's become a place where everyone goes to social media and YouTube to get advice on training and the voice going to personal it's training. Exactly that, yeah, so you're basically like just constantly swimming, swimming as hard yeah. as possible just to stay current now. Yeah. So have you guys done that? That I have this thing, we've got some really old you know, videos on YouTube that I'm somewhat embarrassed about when you go back and look at them. Have you guys taken your old videos mm. down or are they still there? Because ours are still there. Yeah. Jack, I don't want to take there, them off. There is... I'm like, oh gosh, we like... Yeah, most of you them are. keep the originals. Like, 90% of them are there, including our first video. There's a few that I'd taken down, which I just don't agree with anymore in terms of training principles and stuff like that. I look back and I'm like, you know, I don't want people to think that's what they need to do because it's not. Do you know what I mean? It was a different yeah. time 10 years ago. Um, so yeah. there's a few things, probably nutrition based more than anything else that have been taken down um, and just been, yeah, just been killed basically <laughs> yeah i think to be honest like with, with with nutrition and training you're not really invent reinventing the wheel so luckily for us we didn't come in with any ridiculous claims of like everybody has to be keto or do i uh, intermittent fasting or anything like that so we've always been quite middle road with a lot of the bits and pieces that we put out so there was never really any worry of major factual inaccuracies or anything like that it was more just a case of which i think we all do you know we all have our biases you know and and things change and grow and adapt as we as we go through the industry and i think maybe back then you know we weren't i wasn't really eating as much carbs so maybe i would lean towards oh yeah maybe drop your carbs a little bit more rather than you know based on your own experience rather than saying you know carbs are a killer you should never eat them uh so it's just certain things that maybe just changed and evolved as we have but i still love going back into the old archive and sending screenshots and stuff to john i remember this video so i don't do it it's more because we're annoyed at how much older we've got i think more than anything a lot older (laughs) Have you guys found that, like, have you found that um, that process? Because obviously with, with social, and Jack and I have had this experience to a certain point. When you play it down the middle and it's not particularly sort of controversial or divisive, it's not the easiest way to kind of actually build a following and give information yeah. to the people who, well, to put the right information in people's hands, right? We, we'd much rather go and watch The Liver King yeah. than to somebody to say, just eat a normal balanced <laughs> diet. Like, it's yeah. it's a crazy think, world that we live I in. I think a good way to explain it is, you might not burn as bright, but you'll burn for longer. There's few people that have been doing it yeah. for as long as we've all been doing it now and are still credible because they haven't stuck themselves to one thing like eating raw offal or whatever it may be <laughs> and being out there, being controversial to get 
Traction, but traction on that kind of stuff only lasts a small amount of time. Um, and I think that's the reason that we've all remained current because sure, opinions have changed as we've grown a small amount, but our core principles and the value of what we're giving hasn't changed. Um, and you've not trying to, like you say, there was a time when intermittent fasting was nuts and not if you jumped on that, but then all of your diet advice, unless you're gonna rebrand yourself, is around intermittent fasting. So if you call yourself IF John or whatever, you kind of you, you pigeonhole yourself. So it's about being sticking to your to your morals, but also being consistent in terms of your approach and your the value of your content that you put out. Sure, we did silly things back in the day, like Harlem Shake video, which has probably been long deleted <laughs> and now. The cinnamon challenge. Yeah, just what, <laughs> just when you're just still trying to just suss stuff out and gain traction and stuff like that. But actually, any of that kind of stuff was not related to our fitness stuff. And most certainly then, because fitness was so low on on social media in the last couple of years as it really picked up it was always makeup uh, and that kind of stuff and then it was rare that you would get something that got traction that was viral through fitness whereas now you see a lot more of that probably mm -hmm. actually a good chunk of it is now fitness related yeah. um, sex sales in yeah. our industry yeah mm. that's just the way that it is and like we knew back in the day there was mul multiple times where we could have adjusted our method or, and gone purely about growth because and we, we were encouraged left right and center by everybody around us everybody supporting us everybody behind us or on a business level go for growth it was all about numbers 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 get subscribers and we were encouraged for a very long time to do topless content do you know you want to be doing stuff that's just to the point follow one method and follow one piece of advice and everything like that and it's all well and good but we didn't we were fortunate that we didn't start it from a business perspective. Like we only really, if we're completely honest, started running this as a business four or five years ago. Up until then, it was, yeah, it was great opportunities, things were going well and all the rest of it, but we were still personal trainers hustling. You know, for a very long time, this was just that side hustle. And it was actually a, a publishing deal that came in where they were like, you cannot physically write a book for us in six months, if you want to write every word yourself and still do 50 hours of PT a week and run YouTube channel. And we were still going naively. Yeah, we can. We'll be fine. We'll just crack on. Yeah. And it wasn't even until they highlighted everything that we were trying to do in a week that we suddenly realized we're like, we're not really giving this the time and energy to actually build something off the back of it. And that's when it all changed. We just know, kind of went a, for that. That was actually a scary time when you think about it because next to no one then was making a living from anything on social no one was mm -hmm. so you're not only are you going away from security as secure as personal training is you're going to something completely new and just going all right we'll just we'll just suck it and see what happens and really just yeah. kind of carving a new path for want of a better term not that we looked at it like that back then but leon and i've always had this thing whether it's a tv appearance or it's doing something big you just give a little fist bump and you just send it and you just say, I'll see you on the other side and what happens, what happens. But you've just got to, you've got to just take those chances. Um, and it's kind of come around full circle as we started to take things more business minded. We were able to think, well, what do we really want from life? And we want to spend time with our kids. Um, we've both got little girls, not so little anymore. Both, well, Bobby will be four in January. When Jack's four? December. December, just before. Um, so a lot of the last few years for us, actually kind of mm -hmm. COVID didn't necessarily come at a bad time. We got to spend a lot of time with our girls and that's really how we've, we've, we've channeled our time into, if you know what I mean. So then that means that we were able to start coaching again. Like we do a lot of online coaching now. And um, honestly, we do a little less traveling, sim partially because we weren't really able to during the pandemic and partially out, out of choice now. So I think now it's kind of, I know Leon's just been over Sri Lanka to do his 250K ultra marathon, but it's also... I think as a lot of people are probably discovering now, it's forcing yourself a little bit to be a bit more um, extrovert, and make sure you get out and you do these things. So it's very easy now because a lot of things happen in London. One of my good friends, Faisal, he's got a, a launch of a new class that he's starting, which he's super proud of in London next week. And I was like, I don't want to go to London. I, it's for the morning. I don't really want to drive up there. I can't be asked. It's two hours. And I'm like, yes, but... He's there to support us when we do that kind of stuff. He's got something new. I'll make the trip and I'll go. And it's 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 sometimes you just have to kind of give yourself a little kick up the ass to make sure that you are still stepping outside. <laughs> yeah. 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 Nice. Um, 
just shifting gears slightly, which will start to get us going into a bit more, a bit more sort of detail on some of the stuff you, you a bit more current about what you're up to now. But how how you get to where you're now, I think, is really really interesting in terms of both, or you can answer in in any order. But from a how's your view of your own training and that type of thing changed? Um, you know, I remember seeing seeing you know we followed you guys for ages and seeing you doing like a transition into like far more crossfit for example but like what how's your own thoughts and what you want out of training changed over 10 years or even more if you go you know if you go further back if i think of my mindset towards training now compared to when i played like rugby and sports and things it's very different but also what's your um how's your view of the fitness world changed has it changed like compared to you know However, however old you were when you first started PT, like we're excited to train people and did it like, and your view on training, you already said you took down some videos because you thought some things will change over time. Like, just really interested to see what that, yeah. what that journey has been like. Yeah. I think uh, fitness when we started was dominated by your size. It was still, we're still in the shadow of Arnie and that kind of stuff. It wasn't as open as it is now. It was very much about. It's also very American. Yeah. As well. It was about how yoked can you get? Um, and obviously we worked in the gym young lads at the time single when we first started so a lot of it was about how big can you get bodybuilding and stuff like that that's not a race i'm ever going to excel at with my body type so then it puts you it then puts you in the it then puts you in the realms of do you want to do steroids and that was an honest question that i have myself at one point went on and for that that dialogue for us did go back and forth for quite a long time yeah um to be completely honest because when we started, like we remember when we were trying to deliberate over the name, uh, the lean machines. It that was actually, off the cuff joke, wasn't it? it? It was off the cuff because again, it was so d- American dominant on on YouTube that you needed something that was kind of out there in your face. You got like Athlean X, and you yeah, got yeah, like yeah. you know you got buff dudes and stuff like that. So like, cool, let's be the lean machines because it yeah. it sounded you're playing against that American market, and yeah. there was this period of time where. We transitioned from, yes, we were getting some traction, it was going in the right way, to having to deal with the trolling that came back. And, you know, everyone talks about it now like it's just a normal what's, thing. What's that, your best tro- what's been your what's, what's been your best one that you can look back on now and, and just uh, laugh at? Well, I, can remember, I think, to be it? honest, I think one of the worst ones I got was actually nothing to do with fitness. It was actually someone saying... Oh, uh, he's so evil. I think he beats his wife up or something like that. Someone said something really fucking it's vicious. Weird. Like, oh, I can see hate in his eyes <laughs> from like a video. And I was like, wow. But it's like people say, you know, people would come on and say, they're why should even, we? They're not even big. Or they're not even big or you're not even lean. Why should we take your advice? Like that kind of stuff was super, super mm-hmm. common. And we, we did reach this junction of, do you just turn around and get yoked and kind of go down that route, do a couple of courses? Everybody was doing it seemingly from, you know, whether they wanted to admit it or not, there was so much gear in the industry. Um, and it's like, you could do it, get away with it, make your money and get out before anyone really worried. It was it was a, a viable option at the time. But then every single time you have those conversations, you realized, you know, we're luckily we had each other to level us out. And it was like, you realized it wasn't coming from a personal position. It was coming from external factors and external forces kind of drawing you towards this, this idea. And like the fact is, I've always said the same is that if I wanted to take gear for my own personal reasons, because I physically was like, you know what, I've reached my set point. I want to go beyond it. And it's purely just for me. No insecurities, no ego for anyone else. It's just me. Then I would happily take gear. There's no, and I'd be 100% honest and open about it. But I think we always realized it was one of those conversations that was led by external factors. So yeah, well, luckily we didn't get in there. Yeah, and, and what happened for us is actually rather than changing ourselves and what we were going to put into it, we actually changed our surroundings. So when we left the gym, we actually started doing some calisthenic stuff. Leon did a fair bit of tumbling and stuff with gymnastics. We filmed some bits with the bar spa guys and girls a long time ago. Um, and that kind of that was quite freeing because once for, for the first time my value was not on how big or small my calves are, which is an ongoing joke, which I'm the first to take, the, which I'm the first to, to take the piss out of, or how big my biceps are, or what I could bench press. That wasn't the value anymore. It was down to your skill, 
and to a certain extent how big your balls are with some of the stuff that those those guys and girls do. <laughs> yeah. And then and that just kind of transferred into into CrossFit. We were with one of the supplement companies we were sponsored by. We went over to Marbella. Leon and I were like, oh, we're both pretty beat up and excited just to have a few days chilling by the pool. Got there and one of our Punish. one of our best mates, Zach, and him and Sam were in there with their tops off, and I was like, "Who the hell are these guys?" And they were doing like two <laughs> workouts a day, and we ended up just having just so much fun doing that, and that kind of what started our our kind of CrossFit escapades, if that if that's the best way to explain it. And that was super freeing because once again, there is an element to it of vanity that always will be with my fitness. I'm not going to pretend that it's not. I always want to feel confident in myself and that comes with certain stipulations which are set by me uh, which i feel are healthy ones for myself um but that came with the thing of okay every dog has a day are you flexible if you're not you're going to struggle how are you walking on your hands how's your cardiovascular fitness how's your how's your movement in terms of your proprioception how strong are you and all these things that kind of mix into each other and it was just nice for once for me to feel like i was leveling the playing field and not so much in competition with other people but more myself what was my what was I feeling pressure from? And the answer was I wasn't feeling pressure anymore. I wasn't mm. feeling pressure that I had to look like the massive dudes or I had to look like this. All I had to do was be good at whatever I wanted to do. And there were so many different ways and shapes and forms that that worked into it. I just found that pretty freeing. I think for me, that's where my enjoyment and I guess my love for CrossFit really came from. Not really because of the methodology or which I agree with some of it, some of it I don't. But it was just the fact that every dog has their day and everyone has a spot that they can fit into. You might not be the strongest in the world, but I bet you can do something that the big guys or girls can't. Yeah. Mm. I think for me, my training kind of as a youngster was always performance driven. So it was running and then it was football and captain my team and all that kind of jazz. And then it was boxing, did boxing for about three or four years. So I had everything was about performance opposed to aesthetics you know the closest thing to aesthetics was the boxing in terms of the weight category I boxed at I always had to make weight so I was always very aware of scales and stuff like that but not in a negative sense and then yeah. when that became more bodybuilding style which was purely just environmental based I was working in a gym so I started lifting weights and you know you're peacocking you're trying to meet a missus and you think it's all about getting shred <laughs> Um, started the bodybuilding stuff. And then to be honest, I think we both felt extremely trapped by bodybuilding because that's how we built our audience. You know, yeah. it, it was absolutely terrifying to be completely honest when we shifted from predominantly bodybuilding content on YouTube at maybe half a quarter of a million subscribers, I think was around the sort of time we started to shift and went towards CrossFit because you still get it. But back then it was really bad. It was purely like your CrossFit or your bodybuilding. And as soon as we started to change, like these two entities just kind of <laughs> met and, it, and you're getting absolutely caned by that's not a pull up. Oh, that's, what the hell are you doing? You're pushing through your arms and your shoulders. Shut up. Like it was just <laughs> the, the audience went almost completely stale for like six months where right. there was this transition phase of constantly people leaving, constantly people coming in. And at the same time, there's, you know, they're meeting in the middle and views just, our views literally died overnight. And, and it suddenly went from the conversation we had to really sit down and have is right. Okay. So do we just try and put out a bit of bodybuilding stuff every now and again to keep these people happy, the odd ab workout, six pack abs, which is always the stuff everyone wanted. Or do we just continue down this route of taking people with us and getting them to essentially feed off our passion and our enjoyment? So you, you may notice there was a little bit more of a shift towards vlogs. So at this time, people wanted to know a little bit more about our lifestyle. So the audience that started to grow from that point, that, that they grew in a natural sense because they were just following us and they were enjoying our passion and coming along for the ride. And we just went, you know what? I don't care about views anymore. I would much rather create the content that I want to create, which is following the passion in terms of getting involved in CrossFit, than create stuff just for the sake of views because it was murderous. Like we would yeah. sit there deliberating over titles for videos, getting the right thumbnail and all that kind of clickbait crap that you have to do. And then it suddenly just when now I put a lot of love into CrossFit because it was quite, it gave us that transition and that trust to just go and do what you want to do. Um, and now, 
it's for me it's kind of changed a little bit i still do you know i've picked up everything you know i still skip i still do some shadow boxing from back in the day i still do bodybuilding my favorite workout of the week is bench press and biceps love a gun friday always has been and <laughs> and i use elements of crossfit in terms of the emoms the amraps for time that kind of stuff so i still i'm picking up bits as i go but now obviously entering into this um, ultra endurance world, I'm not becoming like an ultra athlete or anything, but one of the things that I've started to really yearn for, especially as I've got into my 30s, I don't think it's a, a, a ticking time thing, but I think just generally it started to happen is I really, I really seek out challenges that are undefinable in terms of, oh, it's gonna take me X amount, or oh, I'm definitely gonna be able to finish it in this amount of time. I look for the stuff now, or I'm attracted to the stuff that scares me a little bit. And it's like, did a 50K last year, first time I've done an ultra. And for the first time I was going into a training block for something going, I don't even know if I'm gonna finish it. And I also <laughs> don't know what state I'm gonna be in. Whereas like when I was doing my CrossFit stuff, you're having these conversations, you're like, oh, this bit's going to be really crap, yeah. but it's going to take about 17 minutes. If I break it down like this, it's going to be an average pace of this. You've got a rough, definable route yeah. to follow. Whereas with this, I was just like, I'm just sending it into this storm and I haven't got a clue what's going to happen. And there was a real buzz. So then, you know, now we've just done the 250 and that's just kind of this door that was slightly ajar in the challenge world has now just been basically kicked through with the sole of my foot. And it's um, moving into that space and carrying all this other stuff that I already do, but now just exploring this new space that I've moved into. Yeah. Nice, man. Great. I think there's some stuff in there, guys. I just want to, I don't want to, you know, sometimes in an interview, you kind of go backwards because you want to go forwards, but it's just a point that you make around some of the, like, the people who, who aren't industry professionals. And I think you can only do this when you've been in the industry for a certain amount of time. You guys have been, like, super open and, and transparent around your struggles and experiences as people who are looked to as models of health and fitness. And I guess my point around this is, like, you, we now see, I look on, having been in the industry for, for quite some time, and looking at looking what I'm seeing online, and you know that so much of it is being driven by insecurity and people looking for validation and they're actually outwardly expressing their own internal struggles through uh, the, th under the banner of health and fitness, right? And it's just, I think, listening to you guys say that and the journey that you've been on is, it will be massively refreshing for people because it's not talked about enough. We, we like to portray that we've got it all sorted. We're super body confident, but the majority of people that are training like that are massively, like, <laughs> insecure with their own physiques right? yeah often the people that are in the best shape, anything you want to come back on often that. the people that are in the best shape are the most insecure and one thing i would just say for people that because we all get in our heads and we all have our own hang-ups and our own things and that's perfectly normal but there is nothing that you can feel which is not normal i think that's a that's an important thing for people to realize where it doesn't matter what your goals are what you're feeling pressure by that's absolutely normal and the problem is is that we like to normalize things that are not normal on social media. We like to normalize the highlights real of people's lives because they think that's what their life's like. Their life isn't like that. I've been doing content online for 10 years and I will know a lot of these people and that is not what their lives are like all the time. They may look like they're having a great time, but they're also sitting in their bedroom by themselves at 10 o'clock at night editing their videos of them being on their jet ski in their swimming pool and doing all this kind of stuff. Like it's not, it's not, they still have to work and they still have to do stuff. And as they get bigger, sure, they get other people to, to, to do that for them. But that's few and far between people that, are, are, that grow at that rate. Yeah, I think the dangerous thing that you have is this virality on social media now, whereby absolutely everything that you're doing gives you constant analytics and feedback. So yeah. somebody turns around and does something or creates a piece of content, puts up a topless photo or a, a, a chick will film a video of her ass or something like that, and it goes really well. Unfortunately, you will look at that and go, well, I need to repeat that again. And it's so, so easy. You'll see these, I see these rhythms with people all the time where they create the content that they want to for a few months, and then they realize that, oh, actually, it's not getting the same engagement that it used to. They'll, they'll then go back to the old formula of, I'm gonna do something really relatable now, and I'm gonna tell everybody how much I'm struggling with my body. You might be struggling with it, but what you actually want is engagement. And that's the thing where there's, you see it from the other side, luckily for us, because we've been doing it for so long, where people are constantly trying to draw their audience in and get the feedback that they need, which is likes, comments, engagements, and, and followers, rather than just putting out content that they enjoy. 
And I didn't, and, and I, I realize now, like, I've been training for the last four or five months for this this last challenge. I didn't really care what I shared and what I didn't. I was just turning around and putting bits and pieces up. And the funny thing is now it's had more feedback, more inspiration to people. It's been, it's grown and gone so much further and wider. And I haven't had one thought of, I need to edit this like this. I need to look at it like that. I need to put a filter on it for this because it's just real life. And I think it's a really scary prospect to get to on social media when you get to that point where you're just freely sharing content. You'll notice like the most calculated content that we ever create now, if you want to use that word, is reels. Because reels get seen by a lot more people who don't follow you. That's the only only thought process with our content. Whereas back in the day for years, we had three years of having to create content that had to be the right piece of content. It had to be how do you, how to lose stubborn belly fat, how mm. to get six pack abs, how to get lean for the summer. Like it had to be that rotation. So we've we've been through the it's, wash of how yeah. miserable that can actually be. So now it's just a case of you know, people, people just aren't there yet. And when they get to the point where they're comfortable with themselves, they'll suddenly just start, you know, it was, it will get a lot less sexy, but it will get a lot more real. And I'm looking forward to that. I think that's a good thing to say is most people, because they're, they're, they're newer to it. I I went to uh, a event the other day for our buddy, Sonny Webster's uh, launch of his mobility app. And I went there and there was people at the social media, which are three generations removed from when I started. And I looked at them like, why am I here? I know I'm here for Sonny because he's my friend. But where do I fit in in terms of this social thing? Am I someone who's trying to cling on, trying too hard? I'm like, well, that's not really my business model anymore. I program and, and train people more. And then people come up to me and go, oh, you're like an OG. And I was like, oh, am I like this new dog should, feature? Yeah, should I, should I, like, I be offended by yeah, that? Or where, should I be really happy? <laughs> where, where, where do I stand in this? And I think Leon made a good point there is when he said about doing the same thing over and over because that's what gets you traction. It's like living in Groundhog Day. It doesn't create a good relationship, but we've done it and we've done it more times than you and we've done the same thing over and over and over again, hoping to re- replicate a result because that's what we felt that our audience wanted to see. And there is a certain amount of that. Your audience fall into the niche that you have, but you've got to make sure that you're doing it for you and it's for the right reasons because otherwise you'll just... It's so gr- miserable. You'll just I, grind yourself down and... Uh, quite honestly, I'm very candid with this stuff, as Leon is as well. I don't mind telling you, like, one of the first <laughs> things I said was I considered steroids. I really don't mind talking about that. Um, but we've done it. We've been through it. And I remember I would sit there when we first put YouTube videos up. No, bollocks. Three years into putting YouTube videos up, maybe longer. I'd put YouTube videos up, and I'd put a lot of time and effort into them. And we used to know that with the real-time stats, if you topped out at 301 views within the first 10, 20 minutes, that would be the cutoff point. It wouldn't show you any more views until the next morning. But if you got there in X amount of time... If you got there in like six or seven minutes, you you know you were You were 10, 20,000 views by the morning started. And I would sit there and I would refresh that bastard. And if it didn't get to it, it would affect my mood for the rest of the day. Or the, we'd put up at evening, so ref- and the next day you're refreshing it. And I could not count. I would... I would kind of like to slash hate to see myself from like a bird's eye view or, or, or and just yeah. watch like a and just watch myself how many times I refresh that phone and how much impact that had on my life for the rest of the but day. But then also as well that it, it was value you know the thing is is it, there was a point where we would like John would spend like a vlog which would be a, it's probably the simplest way to edit is like put, chopping a vlog together you'd spend like 12, 14 hours mm. vl- <laughs> editing a vlog, putting different creations on, learning like videographer and cinematic tools After to be able to, stuff, yeah. to add something in because for a long while it felt like, well, that was a level that that got to. So now we need to go to this level, to this mm. level. But what it was actually was, was happening was the fact that we were just in this transition point where we'd shifted gear and gone into this new zone and our audience were changing. Because like even now we've got, what, nearly half a million people on YouTube. Half of those people don't give a flying one nah. what we're doing now. They're just there. And you just you, you arrive at this point where you realize that you're not trying to constantly bring all of your audience in to every single piece of content you're doing. You're just going back to, we've gone full circle. We're back in day one where we're just chucking content out and we're like, take it or leave it. You know, and that's, yeah. that, that's, the, that's the place to arrive at. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah and like well, we, is that is that because you guys have got like a, a more security and confidence in your business model now? Whereas before, when you were trying to build engagement and audience, people to speak to you, did you feel like you had to play more to the whim or the, the desires of people? Whereas now um, you're actually you taking business a bit more seriously, so you've got more freedom. I, I, there's a turning point for us, and Leon and I will both tell you exactly when that was. Uh, so for once we finished PT, we were all. I was a carpenter before. Leon was a roof tiler. We were used to being in control of our money. You do a job you get paid we did about a year's worth of work and you start working with big brands they it was a, it was a good year yeah so we were basically <laughs> so owed, we, owed, we were owed a year's worth of money which was a modest amount of money for us and it hadn't been paid leon had to was at the point where he needed to redo his remortgage for his house and we were in the position where we had to go look we've got this much money outstanding a substantial amount of money to our agents like where is it because we, and in the end, we got a forward from them of money that we were owed. So Leon was able to sort his mortgage out in the way that needed to do it. And I was saving for a deposit for a house. I was like, we can never, ever be in that position again where all our business cards are in someone else's hands. You can you mm-hmm. cannot be there. You cannot have your business model based on social media because if jobs stop coming in because it gets more saturated, what are you going to do? And if we're honest, that's not why we got into it. It's just what we fell into and became comfortable because the money was good. But that's only finite. They only last so long. And then we were like, well, why don't we go back to our passions? Because this isn't fulfilling a lot of the time. Sure, you go around the world and you meet famous people. I'm not going to name drop because I don't really give a shit about famous people. But the, actually, the only famous person, the one that I really love is Jamie Oliver because he is a dude. He is a dude. Like we like we went when we went to film with him. He the first thing he does is like gives you a hug and then just starts taking the piss out of you. And I'm like, right, yeah, we're besties. <laughs> um, so yeah, like you, you get to meet these people and it, and it's great, but it's not none of that's real life. You don't. Few and far yeah. between do you make lasting friendships or even create a friendship with these people. They're normally facilitated by a third party, whether it's a brand that you're both sponsored by. Um, so, yeah, I think you just you have to be true to yourself. And sure, you get swept up into it. It's great. You get to do all this traveling. You get to do all this stuff. But it's really important you come back home. And what I mean by that is you come back to what your passion is. Because our passion is helping people and it will always be that. And no matter what I do in my life, it will be around helping people. Yeah, I think it, it was a huge shift when when we created our business alongside YouTube, opposed to YouTube being the thing. Yeah. Um, that That's where, like now, in the nicest possible way, I'm like, do I want to film today? If I don't want to film, I'm not going to film. And there was a lot more pressure to film. And I think in some ways the content that goes out now is better because some because back then we used to live to this, you know, like a it used to be like a TV schedule. It had to be Monday, Thursday, Sunday, Monday, Thursday, Sunday. So sometimes you'd try and scrape around to get a video together just because you you could get some content up. But what you realize is that ends up being more damaging they're not uploading at all because it's content that doesn't really make sense. You've not really thought about it. You're not really enjoying the process. So I'd say that the only thing that's really changed is the fact that we now get to decide when we want to create something. Um, And yes, you know, the business models there and everything, and it works really, really well, which is great. Um, But yeah, I think YouTube's just now a a choice. You can't spend 10 years. Didn't feel like a choice. Reinventing a way to show people how to lose belly fat. How, like it's, it's 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 one two videos at max you can't just keep going this is the thing i'll, I'll go back and do what did well for us how can you reinvent that video once a week for 10 you can't not yeah. without going absolutely yeah. batshit crazy it's just not gonna happen um so yeah. you have to diversify and it got to a point where we're like look our audience are gonna come with us or they're not but i'm not gonna dictate my life around what they want to see they can come with us or they can't. And at the end of the day, we'll just go to whatever the next thing appears for us. Um, yeah. What I'm, what I'm hearing from, from both of you throughout that is uh, just a, a really nice message for literally everyone, regardless of where you're at and what you're doing at all. Like everyone that's listening of, and some of it I'm sure will be just like, as we get older in, in terms of our maturity and our self, our, our self worth and our self acceptance. But I'm hearing that you, you gave yourself, permission to go i'm gonna be me and this is and, the, and here it is this is me this is me doing yeah. my thing not trying to be trying to be what you want me to be or be what i think someone wants me to be to make this video go better it's just like here it is 
And like yeah. Leon say, you say, and you're just like the freedom that gives you. It's just yeah, it's just wicked to to hear. And also like you can tell when you say it, you can see it. You can when you're talking about the old times when you were like, you know, compared to saying, well, now I just chuck it out there, and it's like this is me, and like actually. What's cool is that those people that then it resonates with, like, they go, yeah, this is great. And it, everyone's just being real. And the more people like yourselves that are just being real in the real world, is it, it just gives permission for other people to do the same. Yeah, yeah I think you have, to, you have to ask yourself and you have to have a definition for what wealth is to you. Um, and I had this conversation with Sonny and a few people at this thing. They're like, oh, what are you doing now? And I explained to them. They'd be like, wow, I've never thought of that. Or how have you got to that point at this age? Um, a lot of that's through therapy and stuff like that, that I've done for a long time, which has been amazing. Um, but you have to dictate what wealth is to you. Wealth to me and Leon is time with a family and health. It's not money. So money's not our driving factor. So sure, could we do more hours and do more things? Yes. But what do we lose? If we do that, we lose the top of our list. Time. There's always a scale, the isn't there? It's, it's always it's always yeah. a balance. So yes, we do things that we enjoy and we do certain amount of stuff. But at the same time, everything is to facilitate partly security because you've got to have that, but time with, with with our kids and with our wives because you only get that once. Yeah. And I remember we were our, our agent's worst nightmare for like two or three years because yeah. you'd go in for the meeting, the annual meeting, of how, which is all again, it's all just numbers, great. And they're talking about how much you earn, how much you turn down and what the projection is for the next year. And we'd sit there and we're turning down 65, 70% of the work that was coming in. We're like, well, what the hell am I going to do with some blusher? You know, I don't care about that. <laughs> you know, it's like there's, there's so many... There you was put it on your years, face. Yeah, yeah, years and years of opportunity. <laughs> and there still is opportunity that comes in now, which is amazing. But one of the things that we were an absolute nightmare for in some ways for those guys is the fact that we weren't, I'm not going to do a job just because it pays. I'm like, if I haven't got a story to tell, if I can't make somebody laugh, if I can't give them some value or yeah. some education out of it, it's just not going to work. And also as well, every time you do these ads that don't really add any value to people you're ruining your credibility yeah. as well so because of that you know that's that just that just shows you know one of the main reasons i think we're still here is because we I haven't think, sold out a million times to the to the wrong brands i think a good way to define that leon is we were personal trainers and health coaches who discovered and became part of youtube we weren't youtubers who wanted to do health and fitness yeah so we had our principles we had our skills we had our outlines before and we knew what worked and didn't work with clients. So they, they were non-negotiable, unbudgeable things. And we've turned down some pretty amazing stuff in the past because it goes against our values. And that's never going to change. Um, and our values haven't changed because it's integral to who we, who we are as people. Um, that's a good point. We should really film that Mars bar content. Oh, yeah, today. shit. Yeah, we better get that from them. Uh, <laughs> uh, actually, the first ever job we got offered, we hadn't made a penny out of YouTube. And we didn't know you could really. We just They just gave you a CPM once you hit 10,000 followers, which made you got paid click per thousand, which is a certain like a penny per thousand people that views a certain amount of time of your video. And I think it was Mars or Snickers that came in and they offered us 15 grand to do a video. And we were personal trainers doing okay actually but working every hour under the sun 15 grand a lot we're like how many hours of pt yeah. is we're that like, it's like a this lot of hours it's amazing how many mars <laughs> bars could i buy with 15 grand yeah, yeah. So this is amazing but we can't do it uh, and we turn it down we were both just like and we also but we were well. okay about it and that was when we thought okay we're doing so and that was the president yeah. precedent for how we held ourselves and it felt good yeah. to turn that down yes do i eat mars bars yes do i eat mcdonald's yes do I promote them? No, but am I honest about eating them? Yes, there's a big, big difference. Yeah. Um, and it's about being clear with how that sits for you. Yeah, nice. Love it. Well, as you could probably do another 45 minutes, but um, <laughs> I think we'll, we'll maybe save that for another day. But thank you so much for coming on and just, uh, yeah, like being real. I think it's such a refreshing um, voice to hear, for voices to hear from people that have been there, put the skin in the game, come through the other side of it. And the thing that comes out to me is you guys just seem really content where you're at. And that is wealth, right? If you can, if you can find contentment and happiness and joy in what you're doing, 
then the rest of the material stuff is less um, less important. But I think you've got to go through the mill a little bit. You've mm. got to almost got to go there, try and experience it to know that it's not actually what it's packaged up to be. Yeah. And, to come out it's not always perspective. it's not always easy as well being content because on you have the flip side now of am I doing enough? Should I be doing more? So it's about managing that at the same time. I don't want to pretend like, oh yeah, I've got everything sorted and I'm 100%. and all my lines and my ducks in a line. They're not. They're just better than they were before. Yeah, I think for me as well, well it's, it's important like, though, right? Because you, you... I was going to say, I think in terms of when we're talking about the wealth wealth factor as well, I will say now that back in the day, I remember when we got our first big check. One thing that I always wanted to buy myself was a nice watch. And I remember buying that watch and I thought for two or three years afterwards, I was like, oh, I'm going to really regret that because I've just spunked a load of money on something material. But I'll be honest that that still has so much value to me 10 years later because it was, it was a statement. It was a statement. It was it was attached to a moment in time. And it and there's, there is still there is still value in material things. But the difference is, is when they have different layers attached to them and they come with, you know, a, a lot more emotion rather than just, oh, I'm going to yeah. go and buy this because it's filling a hole emotionally. Then, yeah. you know, I still think they have their worth and value. It's just a case of, you know, context. Whereas back in the day, you know, we're seeing people going and buying Lambos and and yeah. penthouse suites and stuff like that. And I'm like, but it's because you're trying to encourage people to come and hang out with you because you've got no friends. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's it was, like it, it was obviously... It wasn't about the watch. The reason it means to me is because it's what the watch, what that watch stands for. I'm yeah, sure. represented, yeah. you know, and that's the thing. It's like, I, st I definitely wouldn't sit here and say that I'm not materialistic, but the difference is, is I'm a lot more calculated with the material purchases that I have nowadays rather mm -hmm. than just buying a new pair of shoes because I'll get a nice comment about them. Whereas now it's like, <laughs> I'm going to buy a new pair of shoes because I want them. <laughs> I've got to, I've got <laughs> yeah, yeah. to ask just like my one final question. Um, Leon, you've done a hundred twenty, two hundred and fifty k ultra in Sri Lanka. What, like last week? Yeah, last week. flew home. It was last Monday through Friday. I flew home Sunday. So, how many days was how many days was the run? So, uh, it was scheduled five days back to back, and you average. You camp in the jungle, you're self-sufficient in terms of the fact that you live off dehydrated meals, you have your whole fuel strategy with you and everything like that, and it just gets transferred to each each camp. And you average 50K a day. So anyone out there who normally talks in marathons, a marathon is 42K. So you average 50, but some days were like 40, 44, 56. There was like a 65 that was supposed to be in there, but unfortunately that got canceled. And then there's like another 45. So you're averaging basically a marathon a day for the week. Um, and it was amazing. Like I'm somebody who absolutely loves running anyway, but I was like a 10 5k runner before this so it's not like i just yeah. walked up to it i ran my first put it this way i ran my first marathon time during training so i'd done like the 50k but i couldn't tell you what my marathon was because i was doing the 50s he's also been very modest it was his first ever ultra marathon and he came third out of 52 people yeah wow yeah, yeah. so right. I got, where was that <laughs> where so was that cool sri lanka uh, well so he came third the... now in that thing yeah yeah so the Holy cool stuff crap. is obviously I massively exceeded my own expectations and I've just been, because I came third, I've been offered a um, spot to the world. Here's some more punishment. Welcome. The world championship <laughs> qualifiers in Slovenia, which I will be turning down, um, which is in June. Not because I don't want to do the running. I have, I, I must admit, I, there's 100% of me that says that I will do another one of these. Um, because, you know, when you're doing these things, from the outside perspective, you see physical output and you see miles or you see kilometers. And it's like, what the hell are you doing this for? But from just the small conversations that I've had, like with John, we did a podcast yesterday talking about it a little bit deeper. The amount these challenges offer mentally and personally is indescribable you, you 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 just can't it's one of those things when people say you can't understand unless you've done it like when i was when I, there was moments where i was running where you know you're having this pure realization that you can't silence the voice the thing is everyone says oh the voice is there sometimes of doubt sometimes it's there to support you sometimes it's not there at all the thing that i realized is it's, it's always there 
it's a case of how you use it and mold it to help you and support you rather than trying to constantly silence it. And I'm like, mm. I've now almost, it sounds really strange, but I've almost got more respect in some ways for paranoid schizophrenics and people talking to themselves on the streets. I'm like, they might even be more awake than what I am because they're, all they're doing is sharing their voice outwardly. You know, it's like there was this, there's this level of conversation and murmuring that's always there. And you know, there's moments where I may have looked like an absolute mentalist running down the world, the road going, yeah, let's fucking go there on. Yeah, you know, I am doing it. We are getting it done. And it's like, <laughs> do I stop? I'm not sure whether I should stop or not. And it's like, you realize that this voice is really just there to try and f seek comfort in the situation. You know, this inner, inner dialogue is anxiety 101. That's all it is. And when you you reach these moments where you're at your darkest, your lowest point, you're having this conversation back and forth and you realize that it's actually your greatest tool. And it was, it was unbelievable. Like, it was a great Young experience. Pivot, so, so. I'm actually, that's exactly what I'm listening yeah, so to right, new, right now. But so yeah, good. it was, it was a great challenge. Um, physically it was great. You know, I thought that I wanted just a medal out of it and all the rest of it and finish it, which, which I got those, which was great. But for me, it was, there's moments that happened throughout that, which were character building. They, they showed me levels of who I was, which I didn't really know that I had physically and mentally and emotionally. And then, you it's know, like a little Netflix movie, it's some really it good sick. moments in it. <laughs> yeah, it was sick. Um, and then, you know, I come back and I get that another, another level of pride where, I haven't injured myself. I'm not completely broken. My knees haven't exploded. I, I've started <laughs> training again and I, and I ran again today. You know, and it's it's things like that. You get constant positive reinforcement and all it does is, you know, it comes back and it breeds more confidence and self-belief, which, you know, we, we could all do with a bit more. Well, I've got a fun little run for you in September, if you fancy it, around Anglesey in Wales. Right. Why um, not? 135 Wales, miles like, in three oh, days. <laughs> It'd be easy for you. It's shorter. It's about half the distance. What is it? A Ragnar relay, you say? Um, so it's uh, the coastal path around Anglesey. Um, oh, cool. It's 135 miles in, yeah, in three in three days. It's a bit weird nice. in that the like first day and last day are like 35 miles or something, and then the middle day is like 70. Lovely. Um, yeah. I'm a bit just like, why have you done it like that? that. <laughs> can't we? Can't we just make it even? Um, yeah, that's, yeah that's the way that they do it and they, they always they always put something in there just as a bit of a sickener so but yeah now i'm up for it why not yeah okay i'll send you some i'll send you some details i'll send you one i'll send you have you heard of the dragon's back race i feel like i have heard of that um but they i don't know much about it oh they claim it's like the i watched a documentary they claim it's like the hardest in the world but obviously it's like it's the welsh claiming that they're there but um uh, anyway, it's from the north of Wales to the south of Wales, so from Conway to Cardiff, across all the biggest peaks. Yeah. Um, it's no. mental in a week. You know, no. you need to, the documentary is amazing, amazing. Yeah. There's this lady that comes like third or something, and she's just like jogging in, like smiling, hello everybody, every day, just like absolutely fine. It's like incredible. Legend. Do you know what I'm pleased about? This podcast is literally taking on the exact advice from you boys and you've, you've sacked off what everyone wants to listen to. You've got two running noises. <laughs> exactly. Just be in position. <laughs> Leon gave me position to be I myself. I don't care whether you want to listen or not. <laughs> there you go. Brilliant. And, and lads, thank you so much for having boys. us on. Like Massive respect for you guys as well and what you do and, and keep on fighting the good fight, as they say. I appreciate it. Thank you, boys. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. We, hopefully we'll catch up with you again soon. Sounds good. Sent. There we have it. A fascinating conversation. I'm just going away like uplifted. Um feel like I just wanna yeah, go and just be be more us. Like how how much of us can we be? Um I just You're think that's quite, just you such already, a wicked. Jacker, I think. You are generally quite authentic on online already. You do a good job of that. Yeah, no, I'm not I don't I don't think I don't think that we're not authentic. I just think the whole like oh yeah, for like yeah, like that's what I that's what I want to do. It's like let's go and do that, whatever that whatever that thing is. And I and I just hope that people listening of of feeling that as well and taking giving yourself permission to like whatever it, those things that you want to do or how you want to be like, just if that's right for you, then then go and do it. And I think that one of the things that the boys said was, you know, it's not about 
it's not about sort of playing the game they've been there and done that and like trying to actually just the more honest we can be with ourselves the better and you know in all honesty you, you you're probably going to think this is a five star review on itunes or wherever you listen to your podcast aren't you so it's probably just fair to just give that 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 honest five star uh five star <laughs> review for the podcast there we go we got it in there we're gonna put out we're gonna put out our own content it doesn't matter what the people think <laughs> yeah i mean it doesn't matter because we're just gonna do, carry on doing the podcast we like having but it does make a difference to the bottom line <clears throat> um anyway yeah so yes. we hope you've enjoyed that one guys thank you massively to john and leon for coming on and uh, and just yeah being open transparent talk about things that the fitness industry needs to talk more about and also the influence of of social media media and some advice from people that have been there and very much done it got the t-shirt so until next time keep exploring your physical potential with movement strength and play class dismissed